anything that the Lord is in front of, we should have reverence and respect. And the Lord's prayer is no different than that. When Jesus was telling his disciples, here's how you pray. And when you're thinking about the Lord's, you know, we are the Lord's. The disciples were brand new to this Christianity thing. Some of them were converts from John the Baptist, and they knew a little bit about what was taking place. But this whole new concept of Jesus and taking over a religious system and how to pray to God and what was all this stuff about, they were foreign to the idea of what they should do. And Jesus was just talking to him, and, and he was saying, guys, there's, there's a priority here within our life that we have to learn how to be godly, how to be a group of individuals, how to be a church, and how we can pray from us to God in order to hear God's voice and to do great things that God wants us to do. And they said, we don't, we don't know how to do that. We've, we've never talked to God. And of course, they had. They had been talking to God in the flesh. But Jesus walks up to him and he said this. He goes, guys, this is not about you. There's not going to be a singular name in this Lord's Prayer. This is about a group. This is about the body of Christ. This is about the church. This is about the group of disciples. We need God's power to be upon our group in order for our group to be successful. So when we pray this prayer, when we individually pray this prayer, we have to look at there's a purpose behind Jesus giving us this prayer. The repetitious prayer of the Lord's Prayer every time before meal or every night before we go to bed is meaningless unless it has power behind what it says. The only way that it has power behind what it says is when you take the Lord's, Lord's Prayer and you say the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, and you dissect it down, not just to say the words, but to feel the compassion, to list the names, to think about what we have done and what has been done to us. Think about where we are going and what we are doing. The Lord's Prayer is not just a set of words on a paper that we can recite in order to get God's blessing. God could care less whether we can read. God wants us from our heart to understand that Jesus wants our life. He wants our soul. He wants our worship. He wants our humility. So the disciples were sitting there and they said, we really don't know what you're talking about. And in the next few weeks, we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. But I want to I wanna ask you to think about you being a disciple. You being a brand new church member. I want you to go back a few years and you come into church for the very first time. You've never really recited the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you didn't go to a Christian school and you really didn't know anything about the Bible. And for the very first time, somebody comes up to you and they want to tell you what the Lord's Prayer is all about and how we can attach the Lord's Prayer to our life and the con conditions that Jesus puts on the Lord's Prayer in order for God to do great things. It's a very simple prayer, but it is so awesome, the power that the Lord's Prayer has. And he just says this, In this manner, therefore pray. And he sets it up, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, God is in heaven and he knows all. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He was created. He was never created. He was before creation started. He, he spoke the world into existence. By his words, he could give. He could take away. He had power to do anything that he wanted. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Lord, what is it that you want us to do to fulfill your will? And it's always in us. Our will. Let us take care of this. It's always a group. It's always a church. It's not an individual person. It's what can we do to do what God wants us to do. And he needs us to understand that God's will is paramount. We have to accomplish God's will to do great things. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Talked about last week about the provisions of life. 
talking about whether it's emotional, physical, or spiritual. What we have to do is the physical needs of our life to say, Lord, give to us the very necessities that I need to have. If, if I need something, Lord, I have the right to come before you, and I can pray to you, and I can ask you, and you're more than willing to give to me the very needs of my life. I have to be humble enough to ask you for that. So he talks about his provisions, and then today we're getting in something that's a little bit more stickier. It's, uh, it's getting to be a point in this uh, Lord's Prayer that uh, he's starting taking this personal. Now, if you have your bulletins with you, I, uh, without everybody looking over your shoulder, I want to do a project lesson, if you would, for you. I want you to listen, list uh, a name that nobody else that looks at this will know what this name is, unless it's your husband and he's standing or sitting right beside you, then he probably would. But I want you to go back into the deepest, darkest time of pain that was caused by another individual. Maybe it was a circumstance or maybe it was an event or maybe it was an accident that you could not deal with. And there's a place within your life that there was an event that took place, and if I would mention a guy's or a woman's name, automatic, the hair the back of your head would stand up. It was at a point within your life that if there could be hatred in your life at one point within your life, that would have been the point that you said, I absolutely detest this person and what this person has done. I would like for you to take into your mind and into your memory, I want you to go back to that moment. I want you to go back in that moment, and I want you to write down that person's name. Because that person's name that you write down, that you could go back to that point, and you can stir up all kinds of anger and animosity within your heart and within your soul, that point of time has to be dealt with, because that point of time is the point where God needs to deal with anger and forgiveness. You know, I've shared, I've sh you know, being here for 16 years, I've sh shared all my, my, my stories about my life and uh, the things that have taken place within my life that cause, cause me to be who I am today. Um, many of you have been here for some time and you, you heard the stories and you're thinking, oh, no, no, I, I've heard that story again. But I think there's, there's points in life that takes you to another level. And until you deal with this point, God will never take you to the next point. And as your pastor, I believe it's very important for you to understand uh, me and some of the points that God has had to take me through in order to get to where, not that I have achieved by any means, but to lead you in the area of forgiveness. There was two areas of forgiveness that was the two areas that was devastating to me. Um, first area was um, my best man in my wedding. It was my brother. And uh, my brother had all kinds of issues and he was not a perfect guy by any means, but we were, we were friends. And uh, uh, he lived in Manhattan, and uh, uh, he had a girlfriend, and uh, he was married at the time. And uh, uh, his girlfriend's husband came home, and they got in a fight, and um, he killed her. He shot him right and killed him. And I know Gary was in the wrong, okay? But in my spirit, I hated that guy that killed my brother. I hated him. So we went through the courtroom and went through the trial, and uh, they call, he tried to call it self-defense. And um, there was so much animosity and anger and bitterness put into my life. I was a youth pastor at a church, and I was supposed to come up on Sundays and talk about how much Jesus loves everybody. And then I leave there, and I drive up to Manhattan and sit in the courtroom and talk about how much I hate this individual. The court trial lasted a couple of weeks, and. Uh, it just so happened that I was sitting about three chairs away from the defendant. And uh, started at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, 
on a Tuesday morning and the defense rests at 12. The verdict was going to come back in and they were going to call us all in. So I had about a three hour window in Manhattan thinking about all the anger, animosity, and hatred that I had for this guy that killed my best friend. On top of that, I had my little pistol with me because everything within me, if he was going to be found innocent, he was going to die. And I was an ordained minister. I hated him. Hated him. I sat on the courthouse brick wall by myself for three hours. Putting through all the scenarios, good or bad, that would or could take place. I just had my youngest baby at the house. Been married for a few years. Bitterness, my friend, will change the perspective of life. Because when I sat on that wall there, I said, you know what, he'll be all right. She'll be remarried. I'm going to win. And for two hours, Satan was on this ear telling me everything that vengeance should do. And God was setting everything that he has already done. He's already forgiven. He's already moved on. And he said, Bruce, I need you to stop. So they called the court into session. This was way before metal detectors. I walked to that front door. A decision I had to go to go through those doors. And there was a trash can on the right. I pulled the gun out of my, I threw it in a trash can. Walked in. Set three rows behind the defendant. Two here. Not guilty. Everybody erupted in applause. I sat there in stunned disbelief that I was the only one. And I, looking back, I, I play with fire, you're going to get burnt. You're stupid, you're going to get caught. I understand all that stuff. It still hurts family and it hurts people. Um, that unforgiveness turned into a very bitter part of my life for about eight years. Eight years. And uh, things started working, and, and I got that taken care of. Um, it's nice. He, he died of cancer about six years ago, so <laughs> I pray that he's in heaven. But bitterness and rank, anger and wrath, they tear you up on the inside. Absolutely destroy you. And that forgiveness that God wants to offer you. He says first, he said, I want to give to you something. I want to give to you forgiveness. But when I give you this forgiveness, I need you to understand that you have wronged others. And if you accept my forgiveness, I want you to look at that name on that sheet of paper. And I want you to look at that name is that person that's on your sheet of paper that you wrote down that you said was the catalyst of anger and unforgiveness and bitterness in your life? What is it that that person has done that God cannot forgive? Because God wants to do one thing and one thing more within your life. He wants to give to you a place of peace and prosperity within your life. And he wants to give you something that you can't get on your own. And that is complete contentment with Christ. And the only way that we can get complete contentment with Christ is when we look at our sin, our trespasses, our life, and we say, okay, Lord, this is yours. Because he goes on to say in verse 13, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then verse 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will the Father forgive yours. I like the easy part was 
Lord, help me forgive. The hard part is, I have to forgive. It's mandated to forgive. So I, I want to list a few things to talk about forgiveness, and I want to end with a, with a story. This is, I think whenever you're talking about forgiveness, forgiveness is a topic that we're all foreign to. Everybody can say, I forgive you. Everybody will say, I'll pat you on the back, and I forgive you what you've done. But forgiveness, forgiveness is very difficult to give, very difficult to receive, and it's very difficult to act in the midst of forgiveness of what has taken place. See, even the church, it's very difficult in the church. In the church, somebody is found in sin, and, and uh, they come up and they say, I, I have sinned, I'm wrong, and they come in the office and we talk to them and we try to minister to them and deal with them, and then, and then because of sin, uh, we, we maybe put some... Uh, conditions on what they can do within the church and they get upset because of that and they walk out the door we're trying to minister to them and they choose to leave because maybe people will not love them or respect them the same way and i believe the bible is so clear that sin is sin jesus had to pay the death on the cross and the blood that he shed for all sin for all of sin to come short to the glory of god Every one of us have sinned. Every one of us had needed forgiveness. And if we have given our life to Christ when we needed that forgiveness, then he said, if I have forgiven you, go and forgive others. How do we do that? Well, the, the, I think the hardest part on doing that is we need to surrender the right to get even. We need to surrender the right to get even. When we look at what forgiveness is, if I have given my life to Christ and I have been forgiven and somebody hurts me, and I have hurt somebody else, it's very difficult to give up the right to get even. Now, we see this a lot in, in kids, and I'm hoping that we could talk about this a little bit. Um, when a husband and a wife, um, they have three or four kids, and uh, they're getting a divorce. Something happens within their marriage relationship, and they start having animosity with each other. And... What happens, they have two or three little kids, and they just want to get even. And when they want to get even, the kids are the pawns, and the kids are the ones that get hurt. And what we have to do is we have to work with them and say, you know what, you guys, you have to deal with your issues. These little kids are innocent little kids, and we want them to grow up to be healthy men and women. But we can't allow the sin of your life or the breakup of your marriage to be hindered and what we have to do is we have to protect our little kids. But sometimes individuals, when they have the lack of forgiveness, will do whatever it takes to get even and even be vengeful to get even with the spouse. And sometimes we need to say, I am going to forgive and I'm not going to try to get even. I'm going to do what I need to do. In, in Romans 6.23, we already read it, but it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we need forgiveness, we fall on our face before God. And we say, Lord, I need you to forgive me. And then the step two is we need to rediscover the humanity of the wrongdoer. The humanity of the wrongdoer. What does that mean? That means we have to remember that we are all sinners. Every one of us. And I know this is so simplistic when it talks about Christianity and, and the church, but we are all sinners. Christ had to die for all of our sins. And the only difference between you and the person that's in the corner in the drug alley is that Jesus has changed your life. The only thing difference between you and my brother in prison is that you have been forgiven. God did great things within your life. What we must do is we must lift up and encourage those people that may have harmed us, that may have done something to us, may not be physical or personal, but it may be in the area of our family. And what we must do is we must come alongside them and love them and forgive them and understand that it is by nature people sin. And the Bible says, and Jesus said, in this way pray, forgive. It is the mature act of Christianity. When somebody has done something wrong, think the best of them. 
just because they got hurt or just because they did something wrong, there are habitual issues out there. There are habitual sinners out there. There are people out there that are trying to hurt and will continue to try to hurt. But if somebody did something or somebody said something or somebody made an action with something or somebody did a deed, a one-time deed, and it is not a habitual action, what we need to do is we need to come alongside them, forgive them, mentor them, and lead them. What we don't need to do, and the churches are full of this, when we find out that somebody comes into the church and they're different than what the majority of the people are in the church, they are shunned at the door because they have sin in their life. Well, the church is not going to condemn the individual. They're going to love the individual in the midst of the sin, but we are not going to wink at the sin that they're in. What we must do is we must still confront the sin, but love the individual to a point that they can see Christ glorified high and lifted up because the Holy Spirit of God is who works within the lives of the individuals. Our job is not to kick them to the curb, but to lift them up so they can see Jesus Christ. And when we can do that, we can get past the forgiveness issue when we know that there's something deeper within my life that I can share the love and the forgiveness of Christ. And then we need to wish the wrongdoer well. We need to wish the wrongdoer well. My other brother that uh, just got out of the state pen, he's, he was in Hutch uh, 30 years. And he just got out of the pen. And uh, I talked to him periodically, and he's, he said, he said, Bruce, this is the hardest thing that I have ever done. I've been in the penitentiary since I was in 18 years of age, and I am 50-some years old now. And you know what? Nobody wants to hire me. Nobody wants to hire me. Nobody wants to hire. I said, well, I wouldn't want to hire you. You haven't done anything in your life. But we start talking, and, and we start working with this, and we're praying for him. We're trying to work within his life. And it's like this. If, so, and if somebody has done something wrong, and I understand, I understand what we should do, but just because somebody is somebody that did something wrong, that has hurt somebody else, we still need to pray for them for the betterment of them. Because what we do and what they do sometimes is they can't get out. There's no hope in the real world without the hope of the world coming alongside them. We are the change agent of the world. So when they are out of prison, when, when God does restore somebody, what we need to do is we need to come alongside them. And we may not have a job for them, but what we can do is encourage them. What we can do is love them. What we can do is give them hope. And give them mercy. See, his grace is a blessing. He gives us in these areas justice when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace when you get what you don't deserve. Jesus gives us all of these things. Sometimes he gives us justice. When you get what you deserve. Mercy when you don't get what you deserve. And aren't you happy about that? And then grace, when you get what you don't deserve. I get heaven and I do not deserve it. So I'd like to share just a couple thoughts on forgiveness. When we're talking about our strength, when we're talking about our humility, we're talking about others that have been hurt. And I'm fully aware that there are scars in every seat. I'm fully aware of that. I'm fully aware that there's been pains and things that have happened to many of us over our lifetime that is so deep down within our soul that when you even hear the word forgiveness, it sends a chill up your spine and an anger to your heart. I cannot. I will not. You have no idea. And I would say, you know what? I know. I absolutely agree with you. I do not have any idea. I can't even comprehend what you even thought about what you've gone through. The pain that you went through. The agony that you went through. The mental anguish that you've gone through. The pain and the scars. All it takes is a thought. All it takes is an event. All it takes is a name. And all of a sudden, those negative emotions come thrilling up inside you to a point 
that you have so much anxiety that you have to get out of the environment that you're in. I understand that I would never understand that. But I want you to know there is one that does understand. You may be able to find a room full of people that you can walk up to and talk to. And there may be a few people in that room that can identify with you and what you're going through. But I do know of the only person I can introduce you to that can forgive and to restore and to love you in the midst of your pain. And that is Jesus. Because in the midst of your pain, he's not judging the individual. He knows what's taking place. He knows your life. He knows what you've done. He knows what's been done to you. But what he wants, he wants you. He wants you. He wants you to come to him. And he wants you to look at him and say, Lord, I need you. I need you to clean me. I may have not have been the problem. But I became the problem when I'm not willing to forgive. And that unforgiveness turns into bitterness, and which turns into anger, which turns into malice, which turns into sin. So now I am so full of animosity and hatred and sin within my life that I'm an innocent individual that's full of all this junk and I don't know what to do. And that's when Jesus wants to come alongside us with the word of God and start giving to us peace, hope, and forgiveness to give to us something that we cannot get on our own. He wants to give us restoration. And then, and then, he wants to give to us guidance. It may not be that day. It may be a long-term effect. But there will be a time in the future that you're strong enough and you're healed enough that the conflict could take place. But when that conflict takes place, the Holy Spirit of God will be beside you. And the freedom will be with you. And God would deal with the issue. But I think God wants to work within our own hearts. The Lord's Prayer Forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. The spiritual realm of forgiveness is, I need to do that. I need to forgive, and I need God to forgive me. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Forgiveness comes, forgiveness does not come naturally. Forgiveness is one of the very most hard things that you could ever do. When you are hurt physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you feel that pain, and that pain is deep within your soul, you can only get that pain removed through the proper guidance of God, allowing the Holy Spirit to work with you and you humbly going before God, not fighting, forgiving. Not looking at what I can get even with, but looking how God can change my heart and get me restored. There's not a counselor out there where I would not tell you this. You're not going to get him. You're not going to fix him. What's more important than fixing him is fixing yourself. Dealing with our own personal issues. Then and only then would we be able to deal with reconciliation. Forgiveness, forgiveness brought together. One on one. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you so much, he doesn't want to leave you where you are. And that is emotionally scarred, physically wounded. He wants to take you, love you, wrap his arms around you, and start pouring into you the ointment of healing. And that first ointment is you have to forgive yourself. You have to let God forgive you of your bitterness, of your pain. The sweetest thing is when you can come off an altar after you talk to God and God has 
given you that, that peace. You may never be best friends with the people that have hurt you, but they do not dominate you anymore. And when somebody dominates you because of the fear and the pain of the past, they direct everything that you do. They control you, and they don't even see you. But when God heals you, you can take that lock, you can put that key in there and throw it away and say, you know what, there will be zero other than God that controls anything that I do emotionally, physically, and relationally that God is not in charge of. And you can turn around and you can walk away a free man and a free woman when forgiveness is offered. Offered to yourself. Offered from God. And ultimately, offered to others. We have to evaluate our first. Your personal life. And I believe when we do that, God does great things. But you know, whenever we talk about forgiveness, I, we call them scars. Um, things that nobody sees. You could walk into a room full of people, all dressed up. We don't see a physical scar on the outside. We could hide that up with makeup or with clothes. But the scars that take place inside are the scars that cause us the most problems. Those scars in your life you've dealt with, you've hidden. They become hardened. You know how to deal with the pain. You know how to play it off. You know how to make a joke or you know how to get mad and you know how to hide. Those are all symptoms of somebody that needs forgiveness. Because your scars are still there. Oh, you know where they are. Maybe people close to you know that they're there. But you don't want anybody else to know. God knows where they are. And God's greatest desire for you is to come down and say, Lord, my life. My soul is yours. Will you fix me? I'm tired of this. I'm tired of playing this game. I need forgiveness. I need God's love. I need his help. And when we can do that, God can do the healing. We'll never be able to do what God can do. The church can be full of 5,000 people. We'll never be able to do what God can do. The church could be as empty as five people, and we can't do what God can do. It's between you and God, and honesty and humility, and let God do what he wants to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you, and we need your forgiveness, and we need your assurance Lord, we know what you've done for us. We know that you died on the cross. and We know that your salvation is for us. And Lord, we've accepted that. But inside of that, we have those issues, those pains, those struggles, those lack of forgiveness issues, and even our scars. So Lord, as we open up this invitation today, for people that just want to pray to you, it may be the very first day of the start of the healing process. It may be the day 400, or it may have been 30 years. But Lord, we ask you to touch their hearts and to touch their lives and to do a healing and do a start of a process that's going to give reconciliation not only to themselves and to you, but ultimately to joy itself. So Lord, be with us as we have an invitation as we pray. We ask you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand to your feet? Now, obviously, obviously, at an invitation time, at an invitation time like this, where you would say, if I go down to the front, people are going to think, what's their scar? 
What are they dealing with? I, I, and I can't assure you enough that the audience of one at this auditorium, the only person that's going to look to you is going to be God. The rest better be praying for you that God would do a great and mighty work within your life. Scars and the forgiveness issue is the biggest issue of the church that we have to get a grasp of, of to forgive, get rid of bitterness, and to take care of those issues so we can have a miraculous future. The Lord's Supper was to the, the Lord's Prayer was to the church. It was to his disciples. And he says, do it this way. The middle part is pray and ask for forgiveness. Whatever it is, let us spend time in prayer. If you need to forgive, if you need to ask for forgiveness, or you need God's help to deal with what you're going through, the altar will be open, some music will be played, and we'll spend some time in prayer.